Good evening. Um, thank you all for coming out tonight to this forum on developing Litt Littleton's Climate Action Plan. I'm really excited to see this many people here joining us. Uh, my name is Sarah Rambacher. I am chair of the Sustainability Committee. And our committee has been talking for some time about how to begin the process of addressing climate change in our community. And so I'm excited to see so many of you here to begin a conversation about the future of our town and its relationship to climate change. As you know, Littleton is very fortunate to have a wealth of conservation and agricultural land. And it's a vital part of our town's character and heritage. These spaces are not only beautiful and valuable natural resources, but they also serve as reminders of the balance between development and preservation. Tonight, we take the next step in continuing the legacy by introducing the concept of a climate action plan. In other words, a structured strategic approach to reducing our environmental impact and ensuring a sustainable future for Littleton. This forum is not just about discussing what a climate plan action climate action plan is. It's about exploring how we can put one into action. We'll be hearing from Tom Birmingham and Jim Snyder Grant, who will walk us through the key areas we need to address uh, from energy conservation to public health, natural resource protection, infrastructure improvements. More importantly, they're going to share their experiences and help us to identify practical, implementable steps that we can take to make this plan a reality. We realize this is not something that can happen overnight or in isolation. Creating a climate action plan will take time, commitment, and most importantly, consensus. By working together as a community, we can ensure that we build a plan that serves as an actionable framework to add a climate-informed lens to our investments in our town's future. Not only will we create a healthier, more sustainable environment, but we'll also strengthen our local economy, improve public safety, and enhance the overall quality of life. So tonight is a chance for all of us to start building that consensus. This is a meaningful step forward for Littleton, and I encourage all of you to engage fully in the discussion after we hear the presentations from Tom and Jim. Your voices, ideas, and commitment are key to making this a success. And now I'd like to, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Tom Birmingham, owner of TRB Consulting. Professionally, Tom is a governance, risk, and compliance thought leader, experienced in developing and implementing integrated risk and compliance programs for several national and international utility and energy companies. In other words, Tom understands how to put policy into practice from cybersecurity and safety programs to supply chain and environmental cleanup initiatives. Tom has worked for Bay State Gas Company, National Grid, Enernoc, and Emera. I hope I'm pronouncing those right. And also uh, a former regulator with the Mass Department of Public Utilities. Leveraging a successful 30 plus year career in the energy sector, Tom's current work focuses on transitioning our economy toward cleaner energy sources. Tom also has extensive energy and environmental experience at the local municipal level. He serves on Canton's Conservation Commission, chairs both Canton's Energy Advisory as well as Climate Action Planning Committees, and is founding measure, member of Canton's Farmers Market. Tom received his BA in Communication Sciences from UConn and his MA in Energy and Environmental Policy from Boston University. Please join me in welcoming Tom Birmingham. Good evening, everybody. It's great to be here in Littleton. It's a bit of a ride from Canton, but it's a pleasure to be here for sure. Uh, thank you, Sarah, for the warm introductions and for, to Don McIver for the invitation. Uh, it's, we, we've got a lot to cover, so I'll get into this uh, right away. So what I want you to walk away with from my presentation, this is going to take some work, but it's doable. We can do this. It turns out the TV people oh. will be really unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> you, you need me by the mic. Welcome to walk. Sounds good. Uh, I'm a wanderer. This may not move. Okay, no problem. If you guys don't mind me standing up here. And... 
Okay, yeah. sounds good. I I forgot we got to be on uh, on TV as well. So welcome to everybody that's watching on cable. So it's doable. The takeaway is it's work, but it's doable. And as it's a great community building opportunity. And uh, I look forward to sharing with you my experience for Canton. So um, as Sarah was kind enough to introduce, my name is Tom Birmingham, and I'm chair for the Canton Climate Action Plan Committee. And uh, as we know, Massachusetts is a beautiful place to live. I'm probably getting feedback talking into two mics. <laughs> but. Um, we're surrounded by natural beauty, and anyway, when I come to Littleton and on a drive like this evening, it, it's spectacular. What a beautiful evening, and the colors are incredible as the leaves change. Um, and we're so close to so many towns and cities that uh, we're very fortunate to be in New England. But as Sarah indicated, there's also a balance we need to drive between development and preservation. So unfortunately, these places and our children's future are at risk from the threat of increasing air pollution and extreme weather events. Um, what I want to offer you tonight is a vision of hope for our future, one filled with positive action. You can take here in Littleton, as we are doing in Canton, to address both the causes and impacts of pollution and extreme weather. I'm reminded, oh, I think I lost the battery here. I'll just stay at this mic. I'm reminded that one of the best antidotes to despair is action. That's why you're here. We're going to create an, a climate action plan to do something, make us feel like we're back in power and control, and feel positive about the efforts that we're going to take for our communities. Just to get a quick show of hands to get me a baseline of what folks, where are you coming from? How many have ever read a municipal climate action plan before? Okay, good. And how many know the causes that are driving what I'm gonna call extreme weather tonight? How many do you think know? Okay, that's why you're here. So you understand that, but we now we need to figure out what to do about it. Um, how many know the difference between mitigation and adaptation? Off the top of your head, okay. So we'll, we'll kind of get into some definitions and terms to help explain that and for our audience on TV. Um, show of hands, how many elected officials are in the room? Fantastic, thank you for coming and thank you for your service. Uh, appointed officials, okay, fantastic. Um, and sustainability, current sustainability committee members. Okay, excellent. So great mix, you, we're all sort of in this together, we're public servants, we're trying to do the good for our community, and that is fantastic. Okay, so let me dive into the agenda, let's see if this works. Okay, fantastic. So what we're gonna cover tonight is what I'll call some climate basics. It, it looks like most of you here in this room have that climate 101 kind of down. We'll cover it fairly quickly so the audience at home can also get a sense of what this is about. Uh, the development process, a climate action plan development process, uh, we'll go over the areas that we're covering in Canton, the covered areas, there's eight of them. Uh, <clears throat> we'll talk a little bit about governance. What does it mean to manage climate action in your town? And then we'll uh, talk about uh, some resources that are available that I've tapped into in Canton and you may be able to take advantage of here in Littleton. And then finally we'll talk about, there's kind of two very different approaches that Littleton could take and some pros and cons associated with each one. <coughs> and if you don't mind, I'll, I'll take questions at the end uh, and uh, we'll just kind of, that'll help me get through. I got about 20 minutes or so to get through this. So Climate 101, uh, human-induced air pollution from burning of fossil fuels is spurring unprecedented change in our climate. What this diagram shows, and you might not be able to see it very well, are some of the impacts associated with climate change. Changing rain and snow patterns, stronger storms, damage to uh, the life under the ocean, it's becoming warmer, snow is melting, you all get that here in this room. 
The climate impacts are more widespread and severe than expected. It's happening. I hate to be a doomsayer, but we're experiencing climate change as the scientists that I watch explain it to me. Uh, and unfortunately, the future risks are likely to accelerate, uh, particularly if we don't take necessary action to slow down uh, the changes that we're causing in the atmosphere, the air pollution. But the word of hope is we can change climate change together. Okay. So this term uh, mitigates and ad adaptation are what I'm going to cover next. There, I, the way I describe it is two sides of the coin. So mitigation is basically a way to reduce the uh, carbon that's being emitted into the air that's causing the air pollution. Carbon, as you know, comes from the emissions of fossil fuels. We're seeing an increase in carbon in the atmosphere that we've never seen before. It's all correlated, it, it appears scientifically, to the Industrial Revolution when we finally figured out how to tap fossil fuels. So the mitigation piece is to slow or reduce the increase in greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere. Flip that coin over and you get into adaptation. What is it about the impact on our world with an increase in fossil fuels and greenhouse gases, the stronger storms, the melting ice caps, the impact of, of climate change that we are experiencing uh, and seeing for ourselves? Anybody have a, someone from their family or friend that's a forester, a fisherman, a farmer, anybody? And have you talked to them and they, they see it? Uh, one of my great um, experiences over the last couple of years is helping the Canton's farmer market stand up. And I'm talking to farmers all the time and it's, they're, they're concerned. You know, they gotta figure out how are we gonna food the, feed the world in a changing environment. So together, both sides of those coins it, uh, are basically the hybrid model of a climate action plan. So I would encourage you to think about both mitigation and adaptation as you're developing your climate action plan. Because in my humble opinion, we need both. Okay, so not everybody raised their hand when I asked the question, uh, what is a climate action plan? So let me just take a quick minute and go through some of the key elements of a climate action plan. So uh, we start with what's called a greenhouse gas inventory or GHD inventory. That essentially tells you where are the sources of emissions coming from in your town. No surprise, most of our towns these days are from buildings and vehicles, transportation and buildings. We don't have a lot of manufacturing in our smaller towns. Um, and most of the you know, emission sources are basically limited to that. So when you do an inventory, there's, um, is, is Littleton a green community now? Yeah, okay. So for folks that are familiar with that term, that's a state designation that essentially you have to create an inventory of your greenhouse gases. Littleton's already done that. I don't know how familiar everybody is with that um, inventory, but it basically establishes your baseline. For here I am today, and the climate action plan will get you to where you want to be in the future. Okay, so that's kind of the quantitative way to measure impact of the climate action plan is to reduce your current inventory of greenhouse gases. Excuse me, in order to do that, we need to establish uh, goals and targets. Uh, how much emissions do you want to reduce over time? And that is, um, we'll, we'll give you some examples of what Canton's doing, what the state of Massachusetts is doing uh, to help towns and cities figure that out. Then there's these mitigation strategies. Okay, what do you do about it? And we'll talk about a few of those today, but you know, it's energy efficiency, changing out your heating system. Most of what you're gonna hear in around the state is electrification. So we move from basic, you know, fossil fuel based generation in your home heating system, oil, propane, natural gas to electricity. Well, then you gotta ask the question, okay, where's that electricity coming from? And we're hoping to make that more renewable energy sources. 
Um, the adaptation measures, we talked a little bit about the difference between mitigation and adaptation. These are preparing for more extreme weather events. Uh, in this year, in certainly in Canton, you're probably pretty close up to here in Littleton. We had, I think it was almost 14 days above 90. The heat wave that we had this year lasted a lot longer than I'm used to. Um, so those kinds of things, you know, what happens to our, our health when we have that kind of extreme heat for that period of time? Uh, we need to come up with some adaptation measures. And finally, engagement and implementation framework. That's where the rubber hits the road. What I've got, you know, in Sarah's introductory marks, I got pretty good at figuring out how to translate policy into practice. I've seen a lot of reports. This climate action plan's a good thing, but in and of itself, it doesn't change the mitigation or the adaptation. It gives you a, a work, a framework to do that, but it doesn't do the work itself. That's where you get into the engagement and the implementation side of this. So real important, that's down the line from where you are today, but you gotta keep thinking, this plan, we don't want this thing to sit on the shelf. We have to make it implementable uh, in order to have the impact that I think we all want in this room. So let's go into why is a cap important? Um, there's basically a lot of different reasons. I've summarized them into five for you all to digest. The public inv and environmental health uh, reasons could be the number one reason. We, we talk about health and safety as real drivers, and that is why I put that number one. Climate resilience, it's being able to adapt to severe weather and recover. I mean, as we've seen in Asheville and Tampa, this stuff's happening. It's really hard to prevent. The, the better we save lives and the more quickly we, we bounce back, that's what the resilience piece means to me. Uh, community engagement, an incredible opportunity to reach out to your community and talk to them. What, what do they care about? What matters to them? And what do they think they would like to see done at the town level? Uh, some real important stuff and lessons learned that we're going through in Canton. I'll share a few thoughts about that in a couple minutes. Access uh, to funding opportunities. Let's face it, it doesn't happen without some financing. A lot of different opportunities. I'm seeing some really creative ways to help finance these plans and uh, the mitigation strategy and the strategies and the ad adaptation strategies uh, as well. So that's all good and we'll cover some of that today. And then finally, economic growth and job creation. There, we've got to sell this to the public. We have to understand what, what people think and it's, you know, and you, you hear this with the election coming up. What's the number one reason people are interested in the outcome of this election? A lot of times it's, how do I put food on the table? You know, how do I earn a living? So there are some really interesting growth opportunities and job creation opportunities that are coming out of the green, green tech and clean tech industries that should not be overlooked. Okay, so the process itself uh, that we're going through in Canton, and we haven't finished it, uh, but we're getting there. Uh, it, it's a three-phased process. As you can see on the slide, I've given you kind of the three phases going left to right uh, and the timeline that it's taken us to go through each of these three phases. There's a lot of pre-work that went into this to get the funding to hire the consultant, to get approval at town meeting for the, um, for the plant, to develop the plant itself. But um, that is, once we got launched, these are the three phases that uh, we're going through. So a couple of months to go through phase one, which is the research and analysis phase. That essentially is, you, I'm sure Littleton has all kinds of plans and programs already developed. You got your green, green communities program. Do you have a mon, uh, municipal vulnerability program, MVP program? Do you have a master plan in town? Do you have open space and rec plan? You already got, you're, you're at least 50 to 60% of the way there. It's already been done. So why do you need a climate action plan? I'll talk about that uh, in a little bit. But in summary, it's to help coalesce and aggregate and prioritize all the different actions that are in all those different plans and programs. I don't know about Littleton, but in Canton, they're kind of 
all the, over the place and there's not sort of a clear vision of which ones should be going now, how to sequence them, and what's the best way to get funding for these things. So the more organized and, and coordinated all these different plans are, and that can, is what can happen under the central governance structure that we'll talk about in a second, um, that's what a climate action plan can do. It can bring all the different groups that you all represent under one umbrella. So phase two, which is we're winding down, it's gonna, we end our community engagement survey uh, on Halloween. And so we're out pushing hard to get uh, community members, businesses and residents to tell us what their concerns are and what actions they would like to see us focus on. And with that information, we then move into, and I should say, um, in addition to that, we're interviewing town departments, town committees, and uh, commissions and boards and trying to make sure that we understand where folks are coming from, what they're already working on. Let's not reinvent the wheel. Let's enhance what they're doing with a more coordinated effort. And um, that leads me to phase three, which is hopefully gonna take probably five or six months to go from collating all of this information that we've collected, coming up with a prioritized plan, going back to annual town meeting and getting the voters to vote on it. And if, if, we, if we do our job well, the voters will say, duh, it makes sense, let's go. Uh, and that, what that includes is the three, three elements. The plan itself, some resources that we think we're gonna need to help implement that plan at the town level, uh, probably a new position or a shared position with another town. Uh, we're looking at kind of both those models uh, and how much that could cost and where does the funding come from. And then finally, it's uh, where's the state federal funding and maybe the municipal, fu municipal funding as well. Okay. So I, I won't get into too much detail and you can probably barely see this if you're sitting in the front row, let alone the back, but this was a summary of phase one. Don, I believe the slides will be available uh, or Sarah through the website. So you, you can look at these at your leisure, but on the right hand side, you're right, the chart number one, that's what the greenhouse gas emissions inventory shows. And essentially what's in, sorry, what's in light blue is buildings. Sorry, it's the, it's the darker blue. Uh, and in green is vehicles. So I'm just gonna point and not talk for a second. Right here and right there. So that's the sources of most of the emissions in Canton and my guess is probably pretty similar in Littleton. So we've collected all this information and the, our consultants helping us drive through this process and then um, we've established some decision criteria and we've also identified some interesting emergency, emerging policies and funding sources through the Inflation Reduction Act and the state, the governor is very uh, proactive on climate and I'm told that the House and the Senate have come to a, an understanding. We haven't seen the, the uh, legislation signed or approved yet at the House and the Senate, but an omnibus climate bill is coming down the pipe. Uh, which is going to have a number of different um, impacts on municipalities that we anticipate uh, will need to be involved in. So that's phase one. Phase two, we've kind of talked about it already, the community engagement piece. We're interviewing steering committee members on, on the uh, Climate Action Plan Committee. There's 15 of us. So we're interviewing ourselves, presenting to the towns, boards, and committees. We've got an outreach program and the community survey. So this all goes into informing the final plan that's in phase three. Uh, what you see on the left-hand side are the targets that are being um, targeted at the state level for emit greenhouse gas emissions or what's also known as net zero greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions goals. 50% lower than 1990 in f f six short years. 75% lower by 2040 and net zero by 2050. That's the state goals. I won't define what the term net zero means, but essentially it's, it's roughly almost no fossil fuel emissions across the entire state. Um, 
so the diagram on the left shows where where Canton is, is that dotted green line that's our 1990 level and you can see how much um, metric tons of carbon dioxide emitted is the blue dot and we've got to get down to that's a big difference and how do we do that through the climate action plan okay so I mentioned earlier that we're going to go through um, the eight different areas that we're working on in Canton. Not to say that this is um, what would fit Littleton, but I've studied a number of different climate action plans and they all kind of look similar. There's some differences, but essentially the eight areas uh, starting at 12 o'clock will go from energy, uh, going clockwise, built environment, critical infrastructure, my friend with a bridge shirt, I love the bridges, um, mobility, transportation, waste, natural resources, public health and resilience, and climate education. Those are the eight different areas that we've targeted in our plan. Uh, don't really have time to get into each one, but there's a lot of definition behind that. And what we're going to try to identify are action items associated with each one of those eight areas that are feasible, fundable, and uh, that that's what the town has decided that that's what they want to focus on. Okay, so how do you manage this? What's the CAP governance structure? Uh, this is what is working in Canton. I think, I think Littleton, you are open meeting, open town meeting here? Okay, so we are too as well in Canton. Um, so obviously we've got the voters, in Kent, we have five select board members. We've got the town administrator. We've got probably, I don't know, 30 some odd departments, you know, from fire and public health to public works and schools. Um, applicable committees, there's a, there's a bunch. You know, you, you look across of those eight areas that I talked about, you're gonna see some of that in almost every single department and committee across the town. So what you're gonna to try to do is make connections with what you wanna do in this plan and who's already doing it or doing something related to that. So you make those connections. Uh, and then this, uh, the big question about how do you make this um, sustainable within your town? You're gonna to need some resources, I think. Uh, it, it, there's a lot of great volunteer work already happening in this town, fantastic. We, all, our committee's all 100% volunteer. But there's going to be, in order to kind of conti continue the effort, once we get the plan off and running, we're going to need some help at the town level. So we're anticipating having to go to the town for some money. Um, I'm in discussions with a couple of the surrounding towns, and we're looking at maybe a shared model to split the costs. There is some grant money, some seed money to get to pay for one, maybe two years of a sustainability energy manager type person but that goes away. Uh, so you gotta try to figure out where is a more permanent funding source for this kind of role. Okay. Uh, just a couple more minutes, we're, we're getting there. Um, thought it would be helpful to show you sort of the couple of big main things that happened to before we got into those three phases I talked about earlier. We had to get approval at the town level through our annual town meeting. It was uh, Warrant Article 27, and I kind of already referenced the three elements, develop the plan, explore resource needs, and explore funding opportunities. That's what our mission statement is for our uh, Climate Action Plan Steering Committee. Um, have you all gone into town meeting yet? Do you have a mandate? Are, and, and is that one of the big questions? Do you need to get that? Is that what we're going to try to? We have not gone to town meeting. Right, right. And, and is the question, should you, do you need to or not? Question of you or question of us? Um, have you considered it? We, we've talked about it in our committee. Yeah, okay. And whether you need to or not. And we, we can talk about that. But uh, the, the upside advantage is you get the mandate. And it's, it's, it's based on the town vote, okay? So when, you, when we start going to the town administrator and the select board and all the departments, we've got some gravitas. You know, we're not just scratching, you know, at the door saying, let me in. 
you know, this is what the town has asked us to do. So that's an upside of getting the mandate. It's some work and there's some risk, but if it's a campaign, you know, it's, it's, if, how, how many people in this room have gotten something on a town or worked on the town warrant article? Anybody done an article before? You got some experience here. It's, it's work, but it's doable. Um, and you, there's some timing and whatnot, but anyway, we, we were able to do that. And then uh, to help make this happen, we formed the committee as 15 people. We raised about $75,000 uh, of planning grant from the state, the, it's a long title, EEA is the acronym, Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. It's a secretary level position in the state government and uh, they have a planning grants. That's what you're gonna need, not implementation at this point for, it, for at least the climate action plan, you need a planning grant. Uh, you need town matching funds to get it from the state. It was 20%, so we had to come up with $12,500. Uh, we got 50. We came up with a 12.5, and then we hired a consulting firm that needed another 12.5 to hit their mark. We were able to go back to the town, and um, through mitigation fund, we were able to get the additional 12,500. And that's when we were able to hire Blue Strike Environmental is the firm that we're using. There's a number of good firms in the area, um, and they're all very busy, <laughs> as you can imagine. But uh, Blue Strike, this is their first Massachusetts gig. Uh, they're based out of California, so uh, they're very knowledgeable and doing good, good work for us. Other resources, again, a little bit of an eye chart for you uh, in the audience, <laughs> but there's technical assistance programs from uh, MAPC. You are within, this is the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. It's a state planning department, and uh, they're regional based. There's, I think, eight or nine of these different organizations across the state. Uh, both Ken and Littleton are in MAPC. These guys are great. They're technical savvy. They've got a lot of ideas. They've got a lot of insight and connection. They've been able to secure some of the in Inflation Reduction Act dollars. And so highly recommend paying attention to that group. Um, the US EPA, no surprise, they have uh, climate pollution reduction grant programs. Those are typically uh, funding for the implementation side, as I said before, you're still in the planning mode, um, and but they're out there. Uh, and then some grant opportunities. We talked about MVP or the Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness uh, grants, and there's also Parkland Acquisition Renovation for Communities grants. This is like open space preservation. There's a lot of land use related stuff out there. Uh, particularly, you know, in those eight areas, we're talking about the natural resource area. Um, so there's definitely, <clears throat> depending on what you all want to do in Littleton, uh, there's some funds available to help with the open space issues. And a couple of little bullets um, down at the bottom related to the technical assistance uh, program funding sources for your future reference. Um, <clears throat> I thought this slide might be helpful, and, and we'll wind down in another minute, but um, this is the big picture. You remember when I was showing uh, the planning phase? There's three phases. This is all of them together. The three phases I was showing you earlier are right there. So, but up front, you, you form the committee. You've already done that, fantastic. Establish the mandate. If it's not through town meeting, you're gonna need some other way to do it. I don't know if your select board wants to do it, um, but some, some authority to drive that. We talked about funding, resource analysis, community engagement, writing and ratifying the plan back at town meeting, and then finally implementation. Okay, so there's an alternative approach that, that what I just showed you on the previous slide, that's what we did. There's always many ways to skin the cat. One idea to consider that um, I, I wanted to at least introduce to you is the um, there are a lot of plans already out there. So how much time and effort do you want to spend developing the plan versus implementing some of the actions? Um, and you could borrow someone else's plan. You don't have to create your own. And what's interesting about this particular plan I put on here 
it's MAPC's plan. So 101 communities are under the MAPC. Um, they've come out to try to address this common problem across all 101 communities. If everybody's going through this on their own, why do we keep reinventing the wheel? Maybe we should standardize and streamline the planning process so you don't spend as much time and effort on that as, and, and get to the real important stuff is we want to have some impact with this. Um, so it's a consideration. And I just wanted to throw a few pros and cons up there to consider as you're, you know, when you break back out into your um, sustainable planning committee, uh, this will be a good chance for you to talk about these pros and cons. But Littleton is a Magic 13 town, which is a subdivision of MAPC, so this fits. Uh, requires less time to develop the cap, allowing more time for implementation. It, MAPC, because of its ties to the state, you, you can see the action items that are identified in this particular plan are consistent with state and federal goals and policies, and there are more action grants available than planning grants. So it's a little easier to get funding for the implementation of these plans. However, there are some cons, and uh, I've identified two on the slide, and I thought of a few others um, after I put this into the mail, so to speak. Uh, cons, you might not get as much community buy-in. And that's a real important consideration. Do you have the backing of the community already, or do you need to sell this to the community? Uh, if you need to sell it to the community, that more the previous slide with that community engagement piece of who, how do we prioritize, what issues do we pick, and the communities inform those, you'll get maybe perhaps more buy-in. Um, this particular approach would still require some customization. I think it's not cookie cutter. You'd have to take this back to your community and look at it and go, well, we don't necessarily have that situation in our town. We've got this, so maybe we need to focus on that. So I think there still would be some customization involved. What other cons that I thought about that you might miss is the technical assistance that we're getting from our third party consultant on the development and the prioritization of these, uh, these programs, and that's pretty valuable. Um, ability to prioritize actions, ability to find the money, um, that's also helpful. And uh, it's, um, it's just either way, it's gonna take some time. So hopefully that was helpful. And I think, Sarah, I'm ready to transition and we'll take questions. Do you wanna do those now or as a panel with Jim or how do you wanna do that? Um, I think maybe we'll move ahead and, and have uh, Jim speak and then we'll take questions after. Okay, fantastic, thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, so now we're, I'd like to introduce our second speaker. Um, Jim Snyder Grant is a retired software developer who became a local environmental activist and is now in his second term on the Acton Select Board. He was on the Acton Climate Action Plan Steering Committee and his compound name happened back when he was Jim Grant and married Dana Snyder. They now live in a local co-housing community which was happy to host some of the early meetings of the Hager Homestead, which you may know, it's about uh, a couple hundred yards that way. Um, and Jim, thank you for joining us. And I'm, I'm going to disconnect here. Mm -hmm. and okay, we get that yeah. special moment of panic when we plug in the <laughs> laptop and hope that it all works. But if not, we have. Disney, Crackle, Tubi, <laughs> Netflix, and Peacock right here. <laughs> well, that's a start. Yeah. There we go. Oh, okay. Great. That's sort of the middle. No, there we go. That's pretty close. Um, okay. Get the front page first. <laughs> okay. We're here. Um, so thank you, Tom, for that uh, great presentation on so many of the fundamentals of what a climate action plan is. Um, so I'm going to take a step back and talk about 
um, some of the earlier steps in how uh, Acton uh, got through a clim climate action plan and what happened afterwards. Our climate action plan came out about two years ago. Uh, it, it, and so I'm hoping that uh, our story will help Littleton and other towns find their own particular way through this process. Um, and I'm really glad that Littleton's put together this panel so we can learn from each other. Um, it becomes very clear very quickly when you're doing climate action planning work as a town that there is so much that's outside of your direct control. Um, and one of the things we can do and have some control over is actually choose to communicate with each other town to town so we can learn from each other. So I'm really glad this is happening. Um, also, as towns, uh, we end up being able to influence other towns. Uh, eventually, when there's a critical mass, we're influencing the state. Uh, and we're also influencing the, 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 the households and the businesses that are in our town, who are, who are the groups of people that are going to be t needing to take most of the action to get us down to that net zero. Um, I never even pressed the, pressed the button to show you the map. But there you go. You got Littleton, you got Acton, you got Canton. We're all different, but we kind of look the same when we're all lumped together in a map like that. Um, one main theme in my remarks is the inevitable but useful tension between the point of view of climate activists and the way town officials tend to look at things. Um, so on the left, uh, there's some uh, key, Keystone XL uh, activists. Um, so at one point, uh, I, I was one of those people and uh, got arrested uh, for um, trying to slow down the actions that were leading to climate change. Um, and then on the right, there I am in my second term uh, as a select board member. So, um, even, so even when there is this tension between uh, you know, the sort of point of view of climate activists and town officials, even when that's the same person, that tension is still there. Um, you know, I go back and forth on how, how I think about climate and how I think about planning for climate change. Um, okay, back to Acton. Um, Acton has some history with climate and environmental work. Um, that's Bob Eisenbrand, um, the, one of the fathers of environmental work in Acton. He got involved when the W.R. Grace site um, started uh, sending pollutants into our water, and overnight we had to shut off 40% of our water supply, which was quite alarming. Uh, activists came together in the form of Acton Citizens for Environmental Safety and helped navigate the process with W.R. Grace, with um, with the EPA, uh, with the state, and with the town. Um, another wave of, of activists uh, came together about 16 years ago around climate and other environmental issues um, under the name of Green Acton. There's their website. Um, that group uh, advised the select board that they should create a town body to, which became the Green Advisory Board. Um, and a lot of Towns have something similar under various different names. Um, uh, the Green Advisory Board then worked with Green Acton to help the town become a green community, um, which you have also become. Um, and that, in turn, led the municipality to focus on uh, reduction in emissions from municipal operations, um, since there is that requirement uh, to create a 20% reduction in emissions uh, from municipal operations. Um, at the time that we became a green community. Um, that green advisory board then widened its scope to include uh, Acton-wide uh, environmental questions and Acton-wide emissions and worked with a consulting firm on our first emissions report that came out in uh, 2019. Um, and now we eventually learned that you don't need to hire a consulting firm. This happened to be from Cadmus to do an emissions report. More on that later, because that's, that's an important thing, because uh, once you get done with one climate, uh, one emissions report, you need another, and then you need another, because you've got to track your progress. So you don't want to be spending money on a big, expensive consultant each time. Um, the next environmental group that came together in Acton was the Acton Climate Coalition. 
Uh, that was formed by local members of uh, Mothers Out Front, Elders Climate Action, uh, Indivisible Acton, uh, Green Acton, and more. It eventually grew to more than 40 organizations, including uh, churches, a lot of businesses, and its focus was the passage of a climate emergency declaration at our 2020 town meeting. Um, so the image on the right is part of the website that uh, that group put together. Um, the little image on the top is the sun rising through the atmosphere as seen from space. So it's to highlight the, the fragility, uh, the, um, the sensitivity and the thinness of the atmosphere, how important it is. Um, the, um, because this was done by activists, rather than, you know, careful town officials, uh, it, it, it was filled with that full, the full appropriate cacophony of alarm. Um, and um, because of the, at the time, we were beginning to understand um, how tipping points were. So that's like uh, the Greenland ice cap melts a little bit. Then it exposes more dirt and ground instead of ice. Dirt absorbs more heat than ice, which tends to reflect it. So then you get more heat, more melting, more heat, more melting. At a certain point, uh, you know, Greenland hits a tipping point and hundreds and hundreds of feet of ice melt. Now it takes a thousand years, but at some point you, 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 you're past the point of no return. And we don't know where the point of no return is for a lot of these tipping points. So based on that urgency, uh, this group that put it together um, adopted a, a target of 2030 to hit net zero. And this is where I go from my climate activist hat to my, uh, you know, town official hat. And I go, oh, wait, that's impossible. <laughs> um, and with my climate activist hat, I go, yeah, and maybe it's necessary. So that's that tension uh, between what's, uh, what seems to be necessary and what seems to be possible. There's a big gap there. That's always um, part of where all of us involved with climate uh, live. Uh, not necessarily a comfortable place, but it's a place that can uh, generate creative possibilities because you have to come up with something. Um, Um, the declaration passed overwhelmingly at town meeting. Um, our, new, our relatively new town manager, uh, John Mangerati, uh, ran with this declaration. Uh, he figured out how to hire a sustainability manager, uh, the amazing Andrea Becerra, who I will tell you more about later, uh, outside of a budget cycle. Um, by, by taking advantage of a, a reorg that had happened. Uh, so there was, there was, a, there was room uh, in, in the count of employees to add an employee, and he, he grabbed that uh, with the full support of the select board. Okay, uh, Andrea Becerra was the, was the sustainability director who was hired. Uh, John had also gotten a community compact grant for 30,000 right before Andrea was hired. And that was to help in the creation of a climate action plan. So that by the time Andrea was there, she could focus right away uh, on the creation of this plan rather than trying to figure out how to get funding. Um, so she and town staff applied for and got an MAPC technical assistance planning grant, grant for 10,000. And that allowed us a very full bore community outreach. One of the things about MAPC, uh, is they're really good at community outreach. They were, they were very, um, they, it, they, they worked with us to help us understand who we are not hearing from. And you know there's, you know, I mean, when you have an open town meeting and you have, you know, 3% of your population showing up there, you know you're missing a lot of people. So they were really good at figuring out, you know, how do we like, you know, go to the cookouts at the apartment buildings? Or how do we find, you know, the, the special groups of people that meet together but don't necessarily meet outside of those groups? They found those people and did a lot of great interviews. Um, it also helped with doing the survey right. Um, the next thing that happened was we finally got, uh, we got an MVP grant for both the Climate Action Plan and an electrification roadmap for the town. Uh, and school buildings, uh, which then was used to hire Eastern Research Group, ERG, 
for a technical analysis of the cap. Now, I think that MVP grants can't be used for uh, planning these days. So, you know, the grant landscape keeps changing, uh, but, you know, new opportunities keep coming up. Um, so that climate action plan, um, uh, as, as did Tom's, as, did, as they did in Can Canton, they had a number of areas. Uh, so here's just an example for buildings and housings and energy of the, this is sort of the, the vision language. You know, what, what's, what's it going to look like when we succeed? Um, and uh, what's one I wanted to point out here? Oh, yeah. The sec act and actively influences policies. Um, that's, again, that speaks to, uh, you know, that we know that we can't do it ourselves. So if we're going to get down to net zero, we need a lot of help. So we have to be telling people we need help, and we have to tell them what kind of help we need. Um, so that's, that's in our plan, is the, the necessity to advocate. Um, underneath those um, goals, uh, there were strategies and specific action items. Here's one example. And these were developed in a back and forth between MAPC, town staff, uh, residents, and a, a climate action plan steering committee. Um, and um, so, you know, in, the, in this planning and zoning uh, uh, strategy, here's three actions. Some of these you'll recognize. Um, you know, gee, why would we be mentioning ha within half mile of public transit? That's because we knew uh, the MBTA zoning uh, requirements were coming our way, and we wanted to be on top of that and use that as an opportunity to be able to come up with, you know, allow building that was more uh, in, have a much lower footprint uh, by being more compact and, uh, and, and closer to <coughs> town services. Um, so um, what happens when you have, you have the, the sort of activist-driven, uh, very aggressive goal of 2030, and then you have the world of, you know, clear thinking, careful consultants who work on these plans is that there's a gap. You know, they didn't, couldn't come up with a plan that would get us to net zero by 2030. Um, so the steering committee uh, led to uh, work with the town to hire this ERG group to really analyze where we were at. And that's where this chart is coming from. Um, you, can't, you can't read all the little, but these are all the different strategies that were going to clearly be leading to some uh, mission reductions. Um, and, you know, if, if they all went well, this is the curve that you would get. You, you, we'd be actually be reducing emissions, but this dotted line is what we needed to get to 2030. So this helps us understand what the gap is. Now, at the time, um, with my uh, activist hat on, I was very disappointed. I was like, you know, ah, we're, you know, we're going to screw up civilization because we're not at zero. Um, and we are not thinking boldly enough. Um, now what I think is we've set the groundwork for making real progress, um, and, uh, being clear that we need help. We can't do this on our own. We can only get down, you know, about halfway to where we need to go without outside help. Um, and it's galvanized us to do things. Um, a couple more things I want to go over. Um, what happens afterwards? Um, so, the key, a successful climate action plan out of that outreach process and out of the uh, community engagement process means there's a lot of people who are willing to do things. Um, so, um, hey, Energize Acton, you, got, you have an Energize Littleton right here in, in Littleton. So you understand this, this, this is, this in, in, in Acton, this is a cooperation, a cooperative effort between the Climate Coalition and the town uh, to give all this information about uh, ways that households and businesses and renters can, um, you know, reduce their carbon footprint. Um, another place where activists are working with the town um, is we're helping to um, we're helping to staff and advocate for the clean energy coach program. So this is about a dozen people. Uh, we've hired uh, the town hired Abode Energy of, of Concord to help us 
train these people. Uh, and we've helped over 200 households in Acton with everything from uh, EVs to heat pumps to insulation. Um, so this is a, just getting information to people through these volunteers has been really helpful. Um, other, other goals and actions in the Climate Action Plan, here's some of how they're being supported by, by the, the volunteer community. Um, Mothers Out Front, Acton, uh, is continuing to work with the schools to find ways to bring electric school buses in. Uh, they're also advocating for Acton's participation in the utilities ground source heat pump pilot program uh, with network geothermal systems. Very cool stuff. It's a way of getting off natural gas. Um, housing adv advocates have successfully run campaigns to get positive votes at town meeting for energy saving accessory dwelling units. And then of course the, uh, they got out the vote for that recent uh, MBTA zoning act vote. Um, transportation advocates are, are busily working on action items in the plan. Um, of course there are some areas we haven't gotten to yet. Um, a few, we haven't really started thinking about the impact, the carbon impact of the materials we're bringing into town. I think especially of steel and concrete, which are very carbon intensive to make. And there are other towns that we would like to learn from that have, been, uh, that have recently introduced ordinances to encourage the use of less carbon intensive uh, alternatives. There are ways of making steel and making concrete that use a lot less carbon. Um, we haven't... Um, we have good general language about how trees are good, which was a pretty easy thing to say. We haven't done the detailed measurement about, hey, if you rip down an acre of pine trees, what sequestration are you losing? Uh, we'd like to understand that. Uh, when we think of net zero, um, we, 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 we want to include the positive benefit of, of the, you know, the, the plant and tree community that's absorbing carbon. And we don't really know how to measure it. Um, and advocating uh, for uh, electrifying the commuter rail. Our, our, the way uh, the inventory is done, uh, we, get, um, you know, we get points off for the emissions of the train as it's sipping through Acton um, and it needs to be electrified. Um, here's some lessons from our sustainability director. Um, so create a greenhouse gas inventory. You've already done that, but you're going to keep needing to do it. Um, she now recommends using the, 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 the much easier to use and inexpensive MAPC inventory tool. There's a lot of different tools at various price points that will help you do uh, carbon emission analysis. Uh, she's, she's really uh, gotten very good feelings about working with the MAPC tool, and in particular that there's this uh, there's this uh, ability that you can take someone who's maybe a, a graduate student in sustainability, hire them as a summer fellow, pay them 25 bucks an hour, and they, you, can, you can get a, a, an emissions inventory done in the course of a summer. Um, and that's so much cheaper than the way we first did it. And, and our most recent inventory was done that way. And it's, it's, it's fine. It's great. Um, as Tom mentioned, there are a lot of plans. There's more every day. Borrow from them. Um, you know, it's those, 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 are, those are public documents. You're not, you're not irritating anybody's copyright by, by taking all their good ideas and leaving behind the bad ideas. Um, surveys are good if you get to a broad set of people, if you have expertise in reaching the people that you want to reach. Um, and you can go quite far with volunteer efforts. As we've been saying, you know, I mean, volunteers are what make this possible. But if you're doing something technical, like a climate action plan, uh, you, you, you need uh, some professional person at the, at, at the heart of it, and you probably need someone who's actually a, 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 a town staff person because they're going to be able to understand uh, you know, all, the, all the complexities of all the different departments and the way the town works. Um, almost done. Um, so again, with my activist hat on, um, when I think back, I think about Acton and these other surrounding towns as having moved from becoming towns to becoming suburbs. And that process seems to have been very environmentally destructive. Uh, we've generated all these extra, uh, all this extra transportation emissions. We've, we're building much larger houses, which are just, you know, at a high carbon cost, let's say. Um, so I... Sometimes I wonder how far back are we going to have to look to understand how to live uh, well 
with our environment. So this is a map, um, it's, a, it's a modern map, but it's about, it's about the era around 1675 or so, very early on in, in European colonization, but uh, you know, thousands of years of, 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 of native indigenous presence. Um, Littleton is lucky. You've, you've now, you, there's been a recent emergence of descendants of uh, the Neshoba praying Indian villages. Um, and in Canton, I know you've started a process of having communication with the Neponset. Um, Acton is also trying to understand, you know, how do we get in right relationship with the indigenous people around us? So I just encourage us, as a closing thought, I encourage us all to, um, you know, learn from people that have managed to live here for thousands of years uh, and have gone through, uh, you know, a, a, an ice age that came and went. Because that's the level of the kind of change we're, we're about to, we've now starting to descend the roller coaster of change on. Um, and finally, I'll just end on thanks and uh, look forward to continuing this dialogue. And uh, the, the tagline from the Action Climate Coalition, uh, I invite everyone to take on building a better future starting now. Thank you. Now we have some time for questions. I don't know if maybe you two can sure. sit there. And uh, I believe we can take this. And if any anyone has a question. Jim, you mentioned the MAPC inventory tool. What are the benefits of that as opposed to the Mass Energy Insight database that we have through green communities? What are the additional things that we get through the inventory tool? Um, it's not, uh, it doesn't have extra functionality. What it has is, e it's easier to use. I, I vote for that. <laughs> <laughs> if I could add, um, we, we used that tool in Canton, and if I can do it, Anybody can do it. <laughs> Hi. Um, so my question is around how far the Canton and the Acton plan can go. And from what I'm understanding is that municipalities can implement these changes. And you can have requirements for businesses who come into town of how you want them to build. Um, but I guess the question, I guess, is so it really just comes down to changing human behavior and getting residents to change their behavior, like, like getting them to compost or buy less food and waste less food or, you know, shut your lights off when, when you're not in the room. Um, you know, how are you going to get people to do that? So, like, for example, probably over a year ago, I got a notice from the Littleton Light and Water Department saying, like, I could... Um, get energy from my house that was driven from solar. And I was like, that's amazing. And then I found out it's gonna cost me more. And I thought, I, I, I got two kids in high school heading to college, like I, I'm not in the position to tax myself. Um, you know, so you're asking people to make upgrades to their house that are expensive. Um, they're not gonna do them until either they're selling their house or something breaks. Like how are you gonna motivate people to change their behavior? Because it's like I'm sort of obsessed with carbon markets recently. It's like you can buy and sell carbon markets all day long, but if the corporations aren't changing their manufacturing process or their supply chains, it doesn't really matter how many you're buying and selling, right? It's not regulated until you regulate it or until you tax people. You know, you, it's going to take a really long time. So how are you going to like get residents to do it? Want to take that? I'll start. Sure. We would probably both have thoughts on this one. Um, so I think there's two parts to your question. Um, the second one is corporations are evil. What can we do about it? I'm going to leave that aside for a moment and talk about um, households. Um, so um, with households, yeah, there's there's this series of carrots and sticks. Um, so um, there's some of these 
changes, like going from like oil or propane to modern electric heating and cooling systems, uh, are going to reduce your operating costs significantly. Um, and um, so getting that information out to people is really important. And then providing the coaching to say, you know, I know this is new and scary and you have to deal with like five different contractors and different specialties to get this done, but we can help you it's, and it's gonna work out. Um, uh, you know, and with, with solar, you know, it's similar. If, if you can give people a little bit of support and show them that, um, you know, at this stage in the game, there are so many easy savings to be had you just have to give people the information and the help, and they're going to do it. Um, now, at a certain point, though, in the process, uh, you know, things are not free uh, or, 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 or going to be saving you money. And that's, that's, that's where the carrots and sticks come in. We rely on the federal government and the state government for a whole variety of rebates and incentives to, to help people move over. And then eventually we rely on things like building codes. Um, so in Acton, uh, as of about April or so, you can no longer b build a building that uses fossil fuels for heating or cooling. We were lucky enough to be in one of those 10 community, there's a 10 community pilot program. Uh, and so, you know, we just, we just gave the, a few months ago we gave the last permit. Um, for, for a fossil fuel building. And there's a, an appeal process for specialized businesses that need it. But basically, that, that was a big step forward. But then there's you know, the 6,000 existing houses. Um, so that's a much slower process. Um, there are towns, there are cities that have uh, tried to understand how to combine a big financing model to uh, take advantage of the savings that come from switching energy technologies to uh, finance um, bringing in these new technologies. But it hasn't been successfully done yet. I think we're close. Um, Ithaca was working on this, but it really, it broke them apart. Uh, you know, their sustainability manager left. Uh, it's, it's, it's really hard, um, but I, I think it's coming. Great, thanks, Jim. Um, carrot and stick is a great way to explain it, and Jim already touched on the cost savings side of this. Um, one thing that's interesting, I don't know if Littleton has done a municipal aggregation program. Do you know if you have qualified? Do you have a? They have a moving light company. Okay, that's it. Yeah. That, I, I knew there was some reason why. <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, let's see. So I, I can try the corporate piece. That's kind of a lot of my background. And being in compliance, I dealt with a lot of a lot of the sticks. Um, there is definitely a benefit uh, to move the needle if you require things. Um, but you also have a lot of technical assistance and incentives to motivate people to make behavioral change. What's interesting, I've been being in the compliance industry for so long, I've come to realize that there's only so much you can do to tell someone what to do. I mean, anybody that has kids, if you tell them to clean their room, what do they do? They don't clean their room. So it just, it's a human behavioral, natural thing to not to balk at being told what to do. So what I've started paying more attention to is this behavioral sciences around motivating people. And what's really interesting, I've, uh, Ogilvy is this uh, advertising, famous advertising firm based in London. And they have developed a program for uh, leveraging the, the way you influence people to make decisions to purchase stuff. You can leverage that the same way to help them stop using as much. Uh, it's a little oxymoron for an advertising agency to take that on. But they're very similar behavioral science cues on what motivates us to, to do certain things that you can use both for on the upside to consume more and on the upside to, to save more. So it's, it's an evolving field. I'm, I'm kind of just starting to scratch the surface on it, but I can see some application to it. Hopefully that was helpful between the two of us at least <laughs> to answer your question. There's no easy answer though at the end of the day. Great job, gentlemen. Fantastic job. Um, if I can just uh, uh, r remark on what Mr. Snyder Grant had mentioned uh, from the last question, uh, being in the 
looking at the municipal budget, and I know, you know, it's it's just been ingrained in me with so many years of being involved in municipal finance that what's the return on that investment? We always are always looking for areas in order to be able to for cost savings, uh, whether it's you know leveraging other grants, other funding sources, other resources such as that. Um, where we're dealing constantly with increase in health insurance costs, which which is constant. We've got pension liability. There is a number of different unfunded mandate mandated liabilities. We have uh, a number of different areas there. So I I appreciate you recognizing that, and I think collectively we can continue to um, to try and, and, and go for that uh, go for that uh, and, and try and close that gap w w without a doubt. So thank you for that. Really, a couple questions. In order to be able to, thinking budget-wise, in order to be able to think, Mr. Birmingham, you turned around and, 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 and talked about, I'm sorry, um, Mr. Snyder-Grant, you talked about bringing someone on in Acton full-time. What, um, what are we looking at for, for an investment, uh, for the position only, and have whoever he or she be, so just trying to think long-term planning. Uh, are we looking at, 70, 80, 150, what, what, what would you, give me a, give me a, a neighborhood uh, that I can think of. I think you've, I think you've appropriately identified the low end and the high end of the cost. Um, you know, between somewhere between 70 and 150. Um, the, um, the immediate savings, so let me tell you a story about Acton Boxborough schools, which are much larger than you know the Acton municipal operation. Um, they brought in an energy manager um, who uh, initially paid for with a small grant, but um, uh, she saved the town the the school so much money on energy costs that that paid for more than her salary, so there was room f for for her because she reduced the operating costs of the town, um, of, of the schools. Now, I don't know about the size of the operation here and whether there's, there's that immediate, you know, one-to-one -one or one-to-many, uh, you know, savings that are possible by bringing a person in. But it's worth, it's worth keeping mm. in mind. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I appreciate that. And I'm going to take you into a challenging location right now. How my, my thought process, as you were talking about Mr. Birmingham and the effects, uh, across the board, and I, I spent 10 years in, in Gloucester, and of six of those as the chief administrative officer. Uh, with that, um, one thing that I heard towards the tail end of my career, my 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 career there, uh, there's no more fish, there's no more fish, there's no more fish, and and so the federal government put imposed different things. So and then I'm and then I'm reading recently the fact of how reefs are dying uh, in, in the ocean, and I, I it's all got to connect in some way, shape, or form. I can only imagine if the, you know. So what I'm what I'm really trying to do in an indirect route is I completely support the town, uh, you know, pursuing um, pursuing this. And as Mr. Houston and and and, and Chairperson Rombacher had has expressed to me. You know, uh, the administration is completely, you know, asking, you know, the support. And we are completely, on, in, in, you know, in support of this, of us taking steps. And in a few minutes, I'll be able to, ex you know, express how we're, what steps we're taking. Thanks. Um, I think we had a, did we have a question here? <laughs> I'm okay. She was first, I think. I'm okay. okay. No, I have okay. a question. So there's somebody okay. There we go. <laughs> so what is the answer to clean electricity if everybody's going to be going to electricity? How are we going to make it clean? We probably both have answers about that one. Sure. Um, I'm a big fan of diversity. And uh, one of the challenges of straight renewable wind and solar, it's the reliability issue. Um, it doesn't always run 24-7, and a lot of our society requires that. Um, it's political charge button, but I will tell you right now, I'm seeing a lot of interest in nuclear. 
And, and what's driving that in particular, ironically, as we're trying to move our, push our society towards more, more electrification, that we're also developing new technologies that require a lot more electricity. So there's going to have to be a significant increase in capacity to be able to manage, particularly all the data centers that are being required for artificial intelligence, Bitcoin, all kinds of uh, additional uses of our computer pro programming and processing. Um, it's, I'm not sure the United States is going to have an appetite for nuclear, but I think given the cost and the benefit of alternatives and the requirements of our society, we need a lot more different options. Um, I will say this from the utility perspective, you know, a, a traditional utility, and you guys have a municipal utility, but you get your power from elsewhere. You don't generate it here in Littleton. Where does it come from and how does it get here? And how do we use it? It's a big puzzle. Um, this municipal aggregation program I was mentioning earlier, we can, it's the single biggest thing Canton was able to do to reduce its uh, greenhouse gas emissions was to sign up for clean renewable energy. Pull the onion back, pull it back. Okay, where exactly is this coming from? What type of energy is it? The, it's a kind of supply and demand issue. The, the um, New England power pool, which runs the whole grid in New England, is developing more renewable energy. But we're also pulling more from uh, Canada, and that's hydro-based. And you talk to the indigenous cultures, I appreciate your point earlier, and it's you're, you're damming a lot of the natural rivers up there. So there's consequences in creating clean energy as well. It's a huge issue. I, you know, and there's consequences associated with nuclear at the end of the day. But if, if we're going to try to look at how did Native Americans live on this land for thousands and thousands of years, they didn't use fossil fuels. <laughs> and there weren't that many of them. That's not necessarily a solution. But I don't know. It's, it's, um, I, I think back to woman in the back, your initial question. It all adds up. It all adds up. We have to each individually make some of these decisions and try to collectively make a difference as a community. I just like to add on to the point of like how complicated it is. It's like we pay farmers, like massive farms out in the Midwest, to grow. At, sorry, I'll start again. So we, as taxpayers, pay billions of dollars to farmers out in the Midwest to grow ethanol corn, and then we. So we're, we're paying for that. And then we pay at the gas pump to remove the ethanol <laughs> from the gasoline. It's a bizarre system. But if you want to get rid of that gasoline, you've got to get rid of those farms or get those farmers to change their f diversity of farming, to get out of growing ethanol corn or move into other monocrops. Like, like it's an export. I mean, the complexities of it are are not going away anytime soon. You know, you're talking about putting farmers out of business. That's not a good conversation to have. Um, just wanted to add some optimism on the, just on the electricity part. Um, there are a, um, a lot of, um, a lot of models out there about how you get to 100% uh, renewable electricity. Um, it's doable in a number of different ways. Here's a few clues. Um, first of all, as the, um, as the grid becomes reliable and longer distance, uh, the intermittency becomes less of an issue because the wind is blowing somewhere. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of wind energy uh, in, in the Midwest and uh, not all of it, a lot of it gets stuck there. It can't get used yet. So as you improve transmission, you can use more renewables more effectively. Um, I, I agree about nuclear, actually, although, I mean, you know, I, it, it pains my earlier self to be saying that out loud. Um, but I believe that the new, uh, I think what you're going to see in the new climate bill is that um, nuclear is going to be able to uh, count as part of our renewable energy portfolio, which it hasn't been. 
before. Um, the other thing, the other thing I wanted to encourage people to read up about is um, the, the the new tech new technologies that are uh, um, basically taking the what we've what we've learned from fracking uh, about the ability to drill at all sorts of odd angles and all sorts of odd places, uh, put down water. Uh, deep enough, uh, it gets to really hot rocks. It heats up. It becomes steam, and steam's a familiar way of generating a lot of energy. We're used to that. So, um, uh, plants that are, um, you know, positively producing energy and feeding it into the grid by putting water deep into the ground and having steam come up are are, are working now. They're they're coming online, uh, and they're being done uh, cheaply and repeated and in a way that can be repeated. Um, so I think that's another that's another technology that's going to be with us for creating uh, stable power, which we need in addition to the, you know, the inexpensive power of solar and wind. Thank you. Um, okay, Rob, and then back yeah. to. You. Sorry. Thank you. I have a tactical question that's going to lead into an invitation to our members or community members who are here tonight and that is you have a 15 member <coughs> committee where did those 15 members come from first of all because uh, we have seven on our sustainability committee so number one where did all these people come from and that's an invitation to people in the crowd you're going to hear they come from you um, <clears throat> second how is it working with 15 members? Are they able to stay actively engaged? You have quorum issues. I mean, that's a lot of people, mm. which is really helpful, but you've got to keep them cohesively together. So I'm sure. just kind of curious how that's working. Finally, before I give up the mic, because I'm not going to get it back, <clears throat> Energize Littleton, <laughs> you saw Act and Energize. Please, if you haven't signed up for Energize Littleton, do so. It's online. You can sign up. You can take actions. You can do things individually to help our community before we even get started on a climate action plan. Okay, great. Uh, great question. 15 members, uh, where do they come from and how does it work? Okay, um, where they come from, we looked at, uh, I, my vice chair and I, took a close look at uh, our networks and we sat down with the town administrator and we figured out what are the skills that would be helpful to have on this committee? What are the backgrounds? What kinds of involvement? And who do we know that has those backgrounds? If you look at the eight areas that we went around with public health, okay, we need someone with public health, natural resources, we need someone with natural resources, etc. mobility, transportation, um, energy. And we were able to come up with a pretty good list, and we went out and solicited. We asked. We didn't sort of have the generic, hey, do you want to volunteer? We went to them. And there's a lot of power in asking people to help. Uh, if you clear what the ask is, you be clear on what the commitment is, and you be clear that we need you and, you, you, and they stay engaged. Uh, truth be told, we've had some turnover. Uh, the, mostly we, because we brought in some high school kids that have graduated. So now we need to get that next generation of high school kids to be on our committee, and we're going through that process right now. So we also identified a couple of town employees that would be good to participate because we know we need any of this work that we're successful in getting into the plan. It's municipal-based. We're going to need some help from the town. So part of the funding... Uh, in the grant that we got was in kind. What that means is you can get, um, the town doesn't have to give up cash, they can give up time. So that was a nice match of the town administrator said, okay, I can find some hours for you for these employees to work with you, here they are. So that was how we got up to the 15 and um, it, it's been it's been an incredible experience to work with these folks that got all kinds of talent um, and interest. The ability to keep them engaged uh, and how much time and work are they able to put into this? It depends on the individual and their circumstances, which change over time. 
some people have physical issues and you know health issues that have take them out of the rotation and then they come back um and i would say you pretty much need a continuous um pipeline like keep looking for the types of roles and responsibilities you think you might need and keep keep an eye out you know there's always people moving into the community there's always people that kids graduate from college or high school that are coming into the to build the ability to uh, volunteer i just got approached the other day i had a call with him today uh, a nuclear engineer of all uh, types of training from mit turns out he's lived in canton for five years and he's an energy guy and he wants to help out so he reached out i'm like okay answer that email get him on the phone get him engaged what do you want to do and bring them in do not say no to volunteer work you need every pair of hands you can get find a job for them ask them to do it nicely thank them for doing it make them feel valued and they will come back thank you and a small technical point that might help too um now there are standing committees that you know need to that are reporting to the select board, and you know they they need they they, they are there and they are important. But there's a there's a part of this climate action planning process, the the middle phase, where it's just about outreach. Um, it's about getting the word out and you know putting the tables, putting the chairs in the right order, and and you know making the calls and getting the publicity out. This is basically. Um, a staff function that people are helping with. And I'm phrasing that very carefully for those of you that are familiar with the open meeting law. Um, this is a working group of people helping a staff person do their job. There's no quorum requirements. There's no open meeting law requirements. These are people who get together when they can. They can communicate by email. Uh, they just get the job done very quickly. Um, and that was, there was a phase in our process where that was exactly the right way to go. These were not people uh, coming up with, you know, suggesting policy. These were people who were getting the work done of getting the word out. Um, and that was, that really helped speed things along at that particular phase of the process. Yeah, I, I've got a couple of questions if I can. Um, one question, you mentioned electric buses. Does Acton own its own bus fleet, or do you lease? Um, we lease. You lease. Um, we, we now have um, some federal money to buy an electric school bus. Okay. Uh, it's not enough money, okay. uh, but we are uh, uh, um, assuming that we will buy it and then have the, uh, the leasing company operate it. Okay, so it's like one bus, it's not a whole fleet of electric No, okay. no. There were people, there were businesses that were claiming that they could, uh, by working with the credits and working with the ability of, the, you know, oh, I have a gigantic battery, I can sell its services back to the grid, yeah. that they could basically fund uh, a, a school system switching entirely to electric buses. Uh, so far that turns out to be a fantasy. Yeah. Um, which is too bad, because it was a great idea. Yeah. Uh, maybe it'll be realizable in the future. But for now, it's, you know, b big federal grants, very expensive. Uh, you're, you're getting a big battery, which is great, but it's a battery that has to, you know, be moving around. So it's not, it's, it, it's hard for it to compete with the flexibility of a stationary battery. Okay. Um, also, um, I wanted to understand a little bit about, um, I know I'm going to get the terminology wrong. It's... Is it the specialized stretch stretch code that Acton's implemented? Mm -hmm. um, and how much pushback did you have for that? Because I've been I've been discussing that with a number of people, and the developers are all against it. The realtors are all against it. Needless, I won't say who else is all against it. Mm -hmm. Person's gone now, but um, how did you get that? the buy-in for that in the town and did you actually go all the way it sounded like you went all the way so that the houses had to be no gas no fossil fuel as opposed to just being built such that it could be fully fossil fuel right so i think you have um so the spe uh, the specialized stretch code 
yeah. um, is essentially consumer protection. Mm -hmm. It doesn't. Uh, the only thing it requires of, of builders, as you know, is to is to wire for a future possibility right. Of, right. of of electrification, right. so that it can handle you know solar panels, it can handle an EV charger, um, you know. So the wiring's there. Um, it it's it's not a requirement to electrify. Um, it just makes it it just makes it more expensive not that's, to electrify. That's where they yeah, would yeah. So why not electrify? Because it's going to be cheaper to operate. Um, so you know, so it's it's a it's a mix of carrot and stick. Yeah. Um, but it's it's mostly consumer protection. I think that's the way I would I would sell it, and that that's what worked at, in Acton. Um, to adopt the specialized stretch code as a way of saying, you know, um, you know, people buying houses today are going to be living in them for a while uh, into a future where electrification is going to become uh, both more and more advantageous and more and more required. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, make your builders uh, prepare you for that. And you got that voted at town meeting, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, huh. the, but your second question was about the, um, the next step we took. Um, we had filed a petition uh, with, with the legislature uh, to allow us to ban fossil fuels okay. in new construction. And, what the legis and a number of towns did that. And what the legislature did with that was they said, well, there's about 10 or so towns that have put these petitions in. So we will have a special pilot program that will allow towns to uh, uh, prevent, uh, pretty much, fossil fuels in construction. Uh, they limited it to the 10 towns. Right. Uh, there's, a, there's a little wiggle room in there for another town or two, but not much. Uh, I, I'm looking forward to the time when that gets fixed. But in the meantime, we're, we're happy to be able to, to do that in Acton. OK. And just one thing, Can I'm I not add, sure if everyone's Do you mind if I add a little bit yeah. to that? Um, we're looking to do that as part of our climate action plan, to include that specialized opt up stretch code or whatever the yeah. name is, I get it confused myself. Um, what's interesting and fairly new in Massachusetts, and I'll call it, you're, you're familiar with Green Communities, yes. I'll call it 1.0. Um, green leaders. Communities 2.0 is this climate leader yep. community I'm concept. familiar with that. And for those of you in the room that aren't familiar with it, this is going to be that next generation of um, again, the mitigation, the greenhouse gas mitigation side of the coin that I was talking about earlier. And um, there are six requirements uh, that we're looking at very closely to see if we can do this in our town and what's the upside of doing that. The, the claimed benefit, I have yet to see the grants and the funding associated with this, uh, and that's being developed. It's fairly new, so the the state is developing what you you will be able to qualify for. Uh, but the it's green community in good standing, which you already are. Establish and maintain a local committee to advise, which which you already coordinate. And you know it's it's your sustainability committee. Um, lead a clean. Uh, Let's see, sorry, that's uh, municipal decarbonization commitment. That's like, what does the town want to commit to to reducing its greenhouse gas emissions over time? And that could be a big push right there. Right. You know, we're going to have, we think we have to go to town meeting for that and establish that. And whether the town has the appetite and what does that mean? I love just slide, by the way, that showed what are the, the, um, uh, tar strategies, the mm -hmm. actions. All the different wedges that yeah. get you down a little bit. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of really good information in that one slide that mm -hmm. I, I want a copy of that. Um, <clears throat> but that's that's the decarbonization roadmap right there. Uh, a commitment to zero emission vehicles, and that gets to the bus issue, it gets to your ambulance issue, it gets to your fleet issue. Okay, so it's a policy to consider w when it's practicable, I think is the term. Okay. So it doesn't force you and require you to have that level of um, commitment to any new vehicle coming through the fleet purchasing plan does not have to be electric. It has to be considered to be electric. Okay. So it's, it's an interesting next generation mm -hmm. that we're trying to make part of our climate plan. And we'll see if the, you know, the, the town was ready to vote for it. Okay. And I just wanted yep. to note one thing, which I don't know if people here are aware of. In Littleton Electric, 
over 40% of the electricity is non-fossil fuel source. So it's just, it's trying to get more and more, but that's where we, where LELWD stands today. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, well, let's give them a big thank you for a lot of information. Thanks, yeah, that was great. Thank, thank you very much. I and I would too. just yeah. like to welcome uh, our town administrator, Jim Duggan, up for a few closing remarks. Thank you. I usually don't need one of these, I mean, because people can hear me uh, all over, but okay. Um, this has been, um, everything okay? This has been fantastic, thank you. Uh, I mean, I, I really haven't um, uh, been involved in sustainability uh, in any place that I was. It was never really, a, uh, it wasn't a priority. So this is uh, some of the stuff that my takeaways, you know, personally, I love, Mr. Birmingham, you turn around and you, the Climate Action Plan, it's a vision of hope for our future. I mean, that really sums it up. And um, some, of the, some of the things I just, one of the things that really that I, I, I think Littleton will, and how we can get people to embrace this as we move forward is, it's not a terminal, it's a terminology thing in the, in the sense that, I, we're not selling anything to anybody. Hey, we're going to try and sell it at town meeting. We're going to try and sell it to the, to the residents. It's education. And that's how, we, that's how we have to embrace this and, and get people to embrace the sustainability. And I mean, it's almost like some of the parallel track that the challenges that recycling took you know, a, you know, a couple of decades ago. I mean, hardly anybody was doing it. Now it's now it's a matter of it's you wouldn't think anything but to recycle, and you see the advantages that you know that does for any community and for the environment, which is fantastic. Um, I will um, really point out uh, Diane Dickinson does a great job for the town with grants and especially with sustainability stuff. So I I, I can't thank she educates me every single day on this stuff and. I'll often walk into her office, you know, like thinking, what, is this, what does this mean, Diane? What does that mean, Diane? But um, really, when I met with uh, uh, Doug and, and Chairperson um, Rumbacher, the Sustainability Committee, about doing a climate action plan, I had to really look it up <clears throat> and understand what it is. And, uh, we, you know, and I, 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 I get it. I, I, I get it. So we, the administration is behind this effort 100%. We have recently been accepted and with three of the communities with Dunstable, Pepperell, and Townsend for the Energy Efficiency Conservation Block Grant in which we have, uh, we've been awarded uh, that as part of a, a regional effort. And that's through... Um, NIMCOG, Northern Middlesex Council of Governments. Why it's NIMCOG, not MAPC? I didn't look a gift horse in the mouth. I, I just said thank you very much, but you know, through the state. And this is obviously through the state. And one of the, some of the things that we want to do there is we want to hire, what's going, what we are going to do, the region is going to hire a regional energy manager. And Littleton's component of that is going to be at the beck and call of the Sustainability Committee. And uh, we want to be able to because what we were looking to do is, um, you know, create that climate action plan, and that's that's a priority that uh, uh, Chairperson Rumbacher had had introduced to me, and that that is what we need to to do moving forward. Um, other things that we are going to be doing with that uh, through that is um, assess uh, a wider uh, town usage. We will review the GHG inventory create mitigation plan, assess the town government energy usage, and a fleet electrification assessment also of, of, of things. So we, uh, we're trying. And so that's why my question was long term, maybe not, not for this budget, but for looking at embracing the sustainability and the, these efforts into the, into the town budget process as we move forward, I'd like to have some kind of understanding and where that where, where we really need to go, because this grant is good, I believe, until December of 26. It has to be done. 
by the end of that. So it's exciting. I, I will be learning uh, every day about this. I'm, I'm excited to do that. But thank you very, very much, the Sustainability Com uh, Com Commission. I, I applaud your efforts. And um, please count me in as, as one of the uh, one of, as Mr. Houston said, you know, uh, the cheerleader. So I'll, uh, I will um, do what I can to uh, to do that, uh, Mr. Chairman. Do you want to announce the uh, uh, meeting next week with um, uh, our state reps and the check? Very good point. Very good point. If you'd like for me, to, but if you, I don't want to take the thunder. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, through the work of uh, our representatives, uh, Senator Eldridge and Representative Arciero, uh, they were able to secure an earmark in the most recent state budget for $100,000 for solar for our, our constructed, what's being under construction right now with the Senior Center. And uh, that was absolutely... It really was, but that was that's a direct result of their efforts. Was a direct result of the select board, you know, making you know under understanding and taking a position, and their voice really resonated with with our local reps to be able to bring an earmark to the community. So I also applaud um, the select board, but our state reps also. But thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and um, I look forward to. Uh, growing and learning more about, about sustainability uh, and how it can positively affect our community. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. I just wanted to acknowledge Don um, for bringing our speakers here tonight. And, um, and again, thank you to our speakers. This was really excellent, very informative, and thank you for your time. Thank you. And